Musicians seem to have an old link to Lucifer because he was the first rebellious worship leader. Musicians, we have a pride that's never satisfied. The jealousy we guard is ours. And then wonder why we don't have what others have. Success others have. Businessmen have this problem too, not just musicians. Why is my business not going? God would be using me mightily in worship and then I'd have that ugly thing just show up in my spirit right in the middle of worship. My feelings would get hurt because here I am, a third leader of the largest revival in American history, but I'm still just playing the piano and I've got more to say than that. You see why I preach on this? I lived it. Since God is no respecter of person, he wasn't about to let me get away with that attitude. If your Holy Spirit is gentle, you got the wrong one. <laughs> Mine's rough. I mean, he's sweet when I need comforting. He's good that, when I'm hurt, he's a great comforter. But when I'm wrong, whoo-wee. <laughs> whoo-wee. Where are you out? So here, I want you to see this picture. I got off an airplane on Tuesday night. Revival started on Father's Day Sunday. I show up the first night, and the church is all changed. Spirit of God's fallen. People are getting healed and delivered. And I mean, we're staying until 3 in the morning. And, and I could tell, see, I was in this moment with the Lord where all these vineyard songs is all I want to draw me close to you. You're all I want. That's where I was. So the evangelist is all fire, you know, and at the end of the service, he comes back and he goes, Lyndall, that was a nice job, but do you think tomorrow night we can maybe punch it up a little bit? You know, when we're out there praying for people, it's two o'clock in the morning and a little bit of pep would not hurt, you know, and you ever heard this song, Enemies Camp? I wish I could say I handled that right. I did not. It wasn't Lyndall. Lucifer just took over. And I looked at evangelist Steve Hill in the face and I said, I know you evangelists, and I know all you Pentecostals. All you want to do is hype everything up through the roof. Now, y'all can imagine me saying this. All y'all want to do is hype everything up. That's not what God's doing. He's using vineyard music right now. He's using something more laid back. That's your problem with Pentecostalism. All y'all do is yell and speak in tongues all the time, and you never let God do a deep work. And God's doing a deep work, and no, I will not sing that's the dumbest song in the world. And if you want all that, pardon me, mess, then find another worship leader. And I spun on my heels and walked. <laughs> and didn't sleep all night long. That mean Holy Ghost. <sighs> mean. That wasn't godly. That wasn't righteous. Here you are in the middle of revival. Well, it wasn't the middle. It was the beginning. Here we are in revival. Look at you. Showing out like that. Evangelist Steve Hill. You're there to serve him. What do you think you are? You little Luciferic acting thing. I don't even know you, how you acted. I mean, that's the kind of stuff I toss and turn. I didn't sleep all night long. When I got back to church the next night, I went into, the, into the, the green room and Steve was sitting at a chair and I knelt down at his knees and I put my hand on his knee and I said, Steve, the Holy Ghost is killing me. Please forgive me for my arrogance. My attitude was totally wrong. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to make it easier for you. I'm here so you can preach the word. I'm here to bless you. I can't believe I said all that. And if you want enemies camp, you're going to get it in six keys. <laughs> well, I went to the enemy camp. Now, some of us would have went out there and went, well, I went to the enemy camp. And I took back, oh, not me, buddy. I thought, if I'm going to repent, I'm repenting all the way. <laughs> took back what is stole from me. I took back what is stole from me. He's under my feet, under my feet. <laughs> oh, I did it with everything, man. I was like, bah! <laughs> Do I still have problems with the wrong attitudes? Well, am I alive? Of course, all of us deal with that. Someone asked me 
one time during revival and even asked me at this church. I get this one frequently because I guess I'm not a morbid worship leader. I don't look like I'm about to lose my best friend when I'm worshiping or I'm in pain. Because that's more religious. You got to look contr contrition on your face in order for it to be really worship. God forbid you're happy. Because you must be entertaining the people. Well, I don't know. I, I, the scripture says with joy, I draw water from the well of salvation. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. I'm sorry, you're off. Okay. You know, why is it when you're sick, you still lead worship like you're not sick? I've known times when you are having difficult situations, when you're feeling bad, trouble, discouragement over things. How do you lead worship every night in the middle of that? And we never know. See, a religious person will say, well, he just puts on the show. I'm too truthful for that. I hope you know that. Yeah. I can't do a show. I mean, I could do one, but it would just be a lie. It'd just be a lie. I assure you, I am not superhuman. It's just because I've learned when I take my mind off myself and I focus my attention on his goodness, I enter the Lord's presence. At that point, one of two things will happen. Either my attitude will change simply because I take my mind off myself or God will fix my problem in the process of my worship because he can't help but bless me when I'm loving on him. Yes. Why do you worship when hell's breaking loose? What a better time. Amen. I feel like I'm standing in three feet of feces. <laughs> My eye stinks. And the Lord says, the Spirit of the Lord goes through the earth looking for those he can strongly uphold. And the Father seeks these kind of worshipers, spirit and in truth. Paul and Silas are in jail, in feces. And Paul and, yeah, I mean, I've been to the jail. I, it's a solid floor. Human excrement is everywhere. There's, the others, there's other people in there. They're chained to the wall. Bonds, hand and feet. We're not talking money, not bonds. We're not talking about the bonds coffee or we're not talking about the bonds. We're talking about bonds. They're spread eagle. Nude in feces. And Paul goes, Silas, this stinks. Silas says, oh boy. Paul goes, Silas, you sing better than me. Why don't we sing, look what the Lord has done. All right, Paul. Look what the Lord has done. Now, what we would have done is, look what the Lord has done. <laughs> this preaching the gospel, look what the Lord did to me. Come on. Come on. Oh, Lord, thank you that you let us suffer for you. Oh, you suffered on Calvary for us. Thank you for the privilege. Blessed be the Lord. You know what happened? God said, Michael, let's get on down there. I, you, I'm used to hearing complaining, but I don't hear complaining. Would you go just grab that worship and bring it up before the throne and just open the heavens so we can just get a better view? Wow. <laughs> Jailhouse rock. <laughs> Angel of the Lord comes in flinging doors open takes their stocks off of them, sets them free. They walk out, blinds the jailer. Don't tell me worship doesn't work. Don't tell me. See, to worship, it either fixes me or it fixes the problem. Amen. <laughs> the key to entering God's presence is he, he's our secret place of joy. He, he's that place. Psalm says, look at this. I love this passage. It's, it's, in, it's in King James. I thought you guys need to raise your education a little bit higher. Psalm 16, uh, uh, 11. Look at this. Now, notice the, the colons that are all here. Okay, notice them. 
semicolon and colon, which tells us what? A statement, and because of that statement, we have something else. Is, is my grammar right? Is my grammar right? Thou wilt show me the path of life, colon, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. <laughs> oh, see, David. King David, the shepherd boy, when he, before he was the king, he didn't have young men's disease. He participated in what is perhaps the world's best known underdog story against great odds. There was a significant difference between David the shepherd and the seasoned soldiers who did not rise to meet the challenge to defeat Goliath the giant. I'm convinced that David was the only one not suffering from young men's disease. Basically, all of the men in, in the Israelite team standing on the battlefield were all churchgoers. They were synagogue goers who believed in the same God, and many of them even from the same tribe as David. And virtually all of them were older, stronger, better equipped to survive a fight with a giant. What made this little pipsqueak, ruddy, redhead boy pick a fight with a nine foot tall giant? What? Why did he do it? David's intimate worship relationship with God demanded that he challenge Dave, Goliath's blasphemous boasts. See, intimacy that's born out of worship and communion in private places produces bold courage rooted in faith. See, I'm a little concerned about how much, pardon me, I'm going to preach to you. And if, if this makes you never come back to the church, I'm sorry, I don't want you to leave. But I am sick to death of politically correct church and I'm done with playing church and I'm done with religion. And I'm just trying to tell you something really straight up. I'm not sure how much we really love God. I'm not sure that we love him at all because we can watch his name be defiled. We can watch his altars being broke down. We can watch his truth trample in the streets and nothing in us rises up and says, wait just a second. No, we're, oh, we don't want to upset you. You know, Jesus is love and grace and mercy and he's got a plan for your life. I mean, where is a David that will go, hold on just a second. Come on. Yeah. What you're saying about God isn't true. I've been with him in the secret place. And let me tell you, he's sweeter than honey. He's glorious. Don't you dare talk about him like that. Amen. Yeah, it's too confrontational for you pansy American Christians. But when the spirit of David rises up in you, it's a spirit of such passionate love for the Lord. It's the same kind of order of which if I called your mother or your wife ugly names, wow. if there's any man in you, what'd you say? I'm fixing to mop the floor with you, boy. But see, we're fine with it. We're fine with it. We have no problem. Oh, well, that's the way they think. And it's not so much the world. The world are sinners. I mean, sinners sin. I love sinners. What drives me crazy is the people on TV and church and they're, they're saying how the church did them wrong and beat them up and, and, and the ones in the house that are fighting us are the ones I'm worried about. It's not the ones out in the street. I mean, sinners sin. They're going to lie, cheat, steal, fornicate and do all that kind of stuff. That's what they're supposed to do. I, I love a good sinner. I really do. I like sinners better than religious people. At least you know what you're dealing with. When they're a sinner, you know what they are. When they're in church, they're a chameleon. They look religious, but there's nothing in there that has a passion for God. It's like, I, there's no passion. It's like, well, I'm just here to see what I can get. You gonna fix all my problems, Lord? And the, here's the problem. What you don't understand, and I'm, is this, if this is too plain, don't be, please don't leave. I really don't want you to. I want you to hear a pastor speak from a pastor's heart. Don't go because you asked God for stuff he didn't give you. Go up to a higher place of going, wait a second. 
I really deserve death and you gave me life. I really deserve hell and you gave me heaven. You've really already outdone yourself. So quite frankly, I'm good. I'm fine. Let me just stay here and say, Lord, I love you with all my heart. And Lord, I worship you because you've never done me anything but good. And Lord, I don't know why my enemies are shooting at me like they're shooting at me. But Lord, I know in due time, you're going to take care of the situation. Meanwhile, I'm just going to praise you. David said, I don't know why Saul's out to get me. I didn't do anything to Saul. I did nothing to him. If David had focused on the enemy, he couldn't have been a worshiper. But that worshiping boy went right in the middle of all, I mean, Saul's trying to kill him. David walked down on that battlefield that day with Goliath standing there intimidating and he did not have young men's disease and he didn't care what his brother or King Saul or anybody else had to say because he heard the, the one he loved being talked about like trash. And something in his little soul said, I can't let that happen, God. I can't, and I can't believe all these people are okay with it. Oh, no, this can't happen. He wasn't interested in man's approval, and he didn't get any. David didn't think about it and meditate about it. He acted from the heart. He had already done the prep work in the intimate place with the Lord in the Judean hills on the backside of nowhere. His public stand for God just happened spontaneously as a natural reflection of a supernatural position. When evil dared to dismiss or disdain the God of Israel, he rose up. What was inside David that stepped into the light and presented itself? A passion for God. David had no role or part in his father's decision to send him down to bring food to his brothers. It was solely God's domain. And he surely didn't have any way of controlling Goliath's personal beliefs or Goliath's daily routine. So he didn't try to manipulate things. David was simply a man of God launched into the affairs of men by divine plan and holy orchestration. He didn't put his life on hold just to anguish over the mystical will of God. I need to go pray three or four days about this so I can go down there against Goliath. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? Can I help y'all? We're dealing, do y'all realize how angry the streets are in America? Do you realize that? Do you realize something has shifted? We're moving toward the coming of the Lord. This anger is, is, is unnatural. The anger is unnatural. Is anybody there? The hatred and the venom is unnatural. It doesn't matter what your political stance or what country, Germany or wherever. There's this seething hatred and it's demonic and it's supernatural and it shows us that the end times are upon us because they've lost natural affection for things. They just are angry, ready to beat somebody to death, ready to kill somebody, ready to slap them, ready to rape them. I've never seen anything like it. Day after day after day after day, event after event after event. Right now. We need some people who've been on the backfield with the Lord, ministering to him, sitting at your piano, singing to the Lord, oh God, you're good, and your mercy endures forever. I will declare your name forever. And in that presence, come out into this mess. And when that thing confronts you, it's not about anger. It's not about indignation. It's about a passion. And you hear God being treated wrong. And there's something in you that says, oh, you don't know him. You don't, know, you don't understand. You don't know him. You can't say that. You don't know him. But that's not what the church does. We march. We use the world's ideas to deal with demons from hell. You deal with demons supernaturally because they're supernatural. And you deal with them by the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus and the power of the word. And the best play to deal with them is worship. Start right there. Because you get intimate with the Lord and you know him and you walk out with confidence. See, when you don't have a secret worship life, you're always wondering, should I say that or shouldn't I? David didn't even think about it. He didn't go seek the will of God. He didn't go to a conference to learn how to find the will of God. He didn't need a prophet to prophesy over him. He didn't need six days of fasting and prayer to go out and face the giant. He'd just been with Jesus. He had been with the Lord and he went, how dare you somebody give me something? He knew one thing. 
He was born to praise and worship God. And he wasn't going to change it. 